Um, the next session, and part of our, the biggest barrier I see moving forward, is our, the psychologi uh, psychological aspect of people seeing events as a safe place, how they actually um, engage with events moving forward, and much like the retail sector and how they're overcoming their challenges, how we get people to come back to live events. Um, I met Tim a couple of years ago, and I saw him speak at Event Tech Live uh, on audience psychology. I can think of no better person than Tim to walk us through. Tim is the uh, executive um, producer at Jack Morton and also a lecturer. Um, Tim. Your bio is fantastic. It says, um, Tim delivers magic moments through customer journeys, experience and storytelling by blending current hype thinking with a track record of producing approaches at work. Um, Tim, we certainly need approaches at work at the moment. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for that intro, Katie and, and Lou. Um, wonderful to think that operations and marketing will work together. I'd love mm. to see those smashed together. And I love the reference to human behavior as well. So thank you to that. But but my biggest takeout, which you missed, Katie, was Botox face. <laughs> Don't forget the Botox face and the mask. Because that, that was my killer point. Thank you, Lou. I have learned something I've learned many things from your chat, but actually that is the one thing that's going to be my headline for now, for today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good. So, um, guys, question to start with. Have we ever been so vulnerable? Um, sickness, job loss, sickness, civil unrest, sickness, and all of this permeated with fear. Like a stick of Blackpool rock, fear runs through everything at the moment. Fear means we occupy that vulnerable moment for both ourselves and our businesses. And the problems are directly in front of us, staring back, unavoidable. Usually at times of change, we can step to the side and commentate and watch and decide when we're going to join in. Now we've got to wrestle with all those things. And yet we have hope. We're driven. We lean forward by optimism. We crave solutions. We reinvent ourselves. We reinvent our businesses. And like Lou was doing, we ask many questions. But we know today's solution is only a momentary life raft, like the withered windblown fruit fleetingly satisfying our hunger, but withering away before we can get to it. So we cling to familiarity at this time. We think past solutions are going to save us. They give us comfort. They give us sanity. But the truth is, our industry was always in a panic before this pandemic. Our industry was actually in crisis because the Internet was like an earthbound meteor that was about to smash into live events and bring digital into the real world. So now, as we accelerate from pause to play to fast forward, we need to make decisions quickly, accurately and authentically. We need digital in the real world. But yes, I know you all know we need a real world as well. And at this moment, more than any, that world is actually controlled by consumers and not by us. Consumers call the tune that all of us brands, dan that all of us brands dance to. And yes, you are a brand. However big, small, digitally competent, digitally savvy, or psychologically naive you feel, you are a brand. And I can't control bringing back the real life, the real world. That's for higher powers than me, Boris. But I can help today to put your brand in a better position to spring forward like a phoenix. So normally you'd find me working with Jack Morton as an executive producer. I work with brands like the big four management consultancies, like EY, like Google, like Facebook, and like Ford. And yet, I struggle also. I jump from discipline to discipline as I strain for my own personal identity. I read endlessly to catch up. I'm driven by fear. I'm driven by fear of redundancy and that Gen Zer who wants my lunch tomorrow. And now I'm joined in this personal fear. Now I'm joined in this personal fear in this COVID world by you guys. And you're all part of that COVID world. And we're all experiencing that fear together. And what's worse, today I'm going to talk about psychology. Double fear. Well, don't worry. The words are going to be nowhere as consuming as these. So let me just get to the right slide. Sorry. The words are going to be nowhere as consuming as these. Psychology can be super hard or it can be super simple. And guess which route I will take today. I will allow you to understand that reciprocity 
is the feeling we have when I buy you a pint and you feel obliged to buy me one back. I will tell you that reciprocity is about you borrowing your neighbour's lawnmower and you feel compelled to take fruitcake round at the weekend. I will tell you that authority is that vice-like grip we're seized by. And the GP says, could you step onto the couch and please take your clothes off? But I'm going to ditch all of those psychological terms today. I want to make things really simple because personally, I've been through too many Manning family Sunday lunches where I've seen the wife and kids glaze over, as I mentioned, the psychology of scarcity as we all reach for that last roast potato. So let's start by talking about the strength of your opening. Digital, face to face or on the phone. Now, more than ever, you have to make your opening count. Yes, today is about understanding the, the psychology of communication with a lockdown audience. So don't be disappointed. But what I'm going to tell you today, I hope, are some really effective proven actions after years of messing things up, after being a psychologist in a marketing and branding world, where I've found the right recipe to give you today some tips, some tricks, some hacks, and yes, a few psychological terms, which I'm afraid are unavoidable in a psychological presentation. And yes, today we're going to start with my headline. We're going to, we're going to do an introspective for the neurotic. I'm going to talk today about five killer ways to speak to a COVID audience. And we're going to learn from my headline, first of all, and we're going to tear it apart like a 1980s telephone directory. Because your most important moment in marketing to a COVID audience is your opening. It's your micro offer. It's your promise. It's an example opening that's written. Um, oh, oh, sorry. It's an example to say it's written, but it also could be a handshake. It could be your first moment on Zoom. It can be the words that accompany your smile. So how do you get that opening right? We want to make that opening value centric. We want it to be that central message where we talk about the benefit to the reader and what they'll get by reading more. If it's a verbal opening, just like a headline, it should summarize the content to follow. That's just table stakes. And so please don't be weak with your headlines. Never say it's just about us. And please don't use those words. And I heard Lou saying, don't use them earlier. Don't say we can, we could, or we might. Don't be lily livered. What would you think of me if I said, I might be able to help you today? Or if I said instead, let's do this. So be strong with your headline and your opening. Don't be that shop assistant who says the pre-programmed question, how can I help you today, sir? Because do you know what? You'll give a pre-programmed answer. No, thank you. I'm just browsing. And my final point on openings is make them really specific. If 9.5 out of 10 pharmaceutical companies love your exhibitions, say that. Say your product's recommended. Don't just say we are recommended. The devil is in the detail. And as David Ogilvy, the famous advertising guru, said, 80 percent of your budget should be spent on your headline. So have a think about that. Make sure you get your opening right. But I'd like you to allow me an indulgence next. Allow me some bragging rights to tell you how this headline and this opening can work. And, and we'll demo it just in a little example, a little case study that I've got. So this was the brief I was given. It was to sell 500 full price cars in 90 minutes. Plus, you can sell them over half time as well, Tim. The legal guys will let that happen during the Champions League final of 2015. This was the creative idea. The creative idea was really to make 500 seem like a finite amount. We used the first psychological term, scarcity. Scarcity is something that we as humans all fear. If something is scarce, it also increases in value. And this was the result. Yes, we made a sensible promise, only 500 available. The headline was strong. It was value centric. It summarized the content that everybody was going to get. And yes, it was time bound. And true to these headlines you see here, yes, I did sell all 500 cars at full price in less than 30 seconds. But to make sure I'm not being contradictory to what I'm already telling you, I take exception to these headlines because we actually sold 500 cars in 29 seconds. So on the phone, face to face, script it, 
work it hard, whether it's on social media, whether it's you opening your opening moment in Zoom, whether it's your elevator pitch, more than ever, you've got to work as hard as you can. And remember, David Ogilvy, who is the guru of this, said spend 80 percent of your time on your opening. So question, did I get my opening right? I hope I've managed that at least. My opening is really um, specific. It was value centric, I hope. And I'm going to give you five killer ways for sure. And I've already shared the first. That is in my opening. So at times of COVID, um, people fear change. I know what I've written here actually creates a bit of a rub for you guys. None of you like the fact that I've switched hearts and minds round to minds and hearts. It creates a problem in our heads. And at times of COVID, we seek control. Your audience seek control. Without that control, we run into the biggest psychological word that I can possibly give you today, cognitive dissonance, which describes those conflicting beliefs and attitudes we have that make us feel uncomfortable. And that clash is always dealt with by rejection, debunking, avoidance, because you make your audience feel out of control. And yet there are so many ways, so many free ways to help your audience feel in control. And here are five really easy ways. The first, review mining. Get to understand what's being said about you. You know all those project wash-ups that you were using over those years that you've never looked at. You know what your competitors are saying. You know when you look at those Instagram comments or LinkedIn or what's said on any review site. Look for the commonalities. That's my first tip. Look for the memorable phrases. Look for what people wanted secondly and look for what people didn't want third. And you have ready-made content to play back to your audience that avoids cognitive dissonance. Play back these phrases to your audience and it will fit for them and it will fit for you. Secondly, I know that at least, um, sorry, secondly, I shouldn't have changed my slide then. Secondly, I know that at least 50% of you um, do not have a brand um, persona that you are shooting at. I know many of you don't even know what that means and you're probably struggling to Google it now. I know that the 50% that do, don't look at it 90% of the time. So I would like you to get into brand personas to start to understand your audience. And the gateway drug for me is a book called Hero and Outlaw, which is written really in marketing terms. And Hero and Outlaw was written by Margaret Mack and Carol S. Pearson. Uh, it allow you to start to create meaningful personas with demographic and psychographic data based on the 12 archetypes. And the 12 archetypes came from Carl Jung. It's a psychological principle from 1912. You don't want to hear about that. Use the Margaret Mack and Carol Pearson book, Hero and Outlaw, and you'll really up your game. Next, what about the platform or channel? Get to know where your audience hang out. You know, I've got two primary candidates, uh, sorry, two primary clients. One of them is based in New York, Atlanta and San Francisco. And the other is based pretty near to Chelmsford. Do you think I talk to that audience in the same voice? Do you think I can talk to them in the same channel? Never. Next point, know your decision maker. Your suit and booted person on a Monday to Friday could be on a yacht at the weekend. They might be running up a fell. They could be a sweaty marathon runner. You never know. Find the messages that are going to engage with your audience. Get to know them. And lastly, survey. Whether you use JotForm, SurveyMonkey, pick up the phone for a casual conversa conversation, the most important action I would urge you to do is to ask that question. Doesn't matter if it's casual on LinkedIn, whatever it might be, start to understand your audience as quickly as you can. And finally, build yourself a tribe. The tribe is the smallest possible audience that love you and love you back. Smallest possible. Surely that rubs against everything I, I know. Well, no, niching down to a small audience allows you to speak directly to their pain points and their needs. You can find multiple niches. That's fine. But really get to understand your audience specifically and their pain points. And if you want some something to read, it's really short. Kevin Kelly, 1000 True Fans is blistering. It will take you 10 minutes to read and you will definitely up your game. And oh, yeah, the psychological principle here is authenticity. I don't have to put the psychology up front. It's about how we action it that really counts. So times of fear. Yes, we all want to act. 
when the government is saying don't go out and buy stuff, there's going to be no food shortages. What do we do? We go and buy. Never tell your audience not to act. We often think that by doing something, personally, even stockpiling, we will start to reduce the risks. Sorry, lost my uh, lost my cue thing. I've got it back. Um, and um, you really get to know your audience and what you uh, to give them a feeling of control. You want your audience to have that feeling of control. How can you give your audience that feeling of control? Is it by building a community when you weren't a community before? And I know some of you on this call today are direct community builders. Could you create masterclasses? Could you do something that creates a smaller user group? Um, this, this feeling of control, this action bias, which again is the psychological principle, is why we had those Zoom parties early on, but we don't do it anymore. Why we all vowed to learn Italian, but we never did. Or why we all created Paul Hollywood sourdough loaves. Yes, unfortunately, we are all sheep. And we do follow the next point, FOMO or the bandwagon effect. We've already changed. And during these times, we do follow the bandwagon. We do follow the actions of others. And it doesn't matter whether those actions are good, bad. We just tend to increasingly uh, increase those behaviours. We're more, more likely to do them because we're in a crisis. So the hack here isn't to follow the sheep. The hack here is to think about that smallest tribe of one. Consumer to consumer conversations are really important. It's not business to consumer. Recognize the most important relationship isn't between your company or your brand and the consumer. It's actually between people and people. And what matters in real life is the conversations between them. How can you start conversations that you are part of? How can you make it feel like everybody's doing it and everyone is taking part? How can you create that forward momentum? Well, you give people tools that provide social meaning and social utility. Yes, you give stuff away for free that helps real world social interaction and supports your audience's interest, interests. So ask yourself, have you given your audience any value, any education, any information, invited them to any of those community chats where they can play a part with you? If the answer is no, you have an opportunity. If the answer is yes, well done. Because products or services that do that get talked about without you marketing. People talk about them in their own um, channels. Next point, and I think this gets missed so often, is to give your comms some love. We don't really give our comms love because we do it day to day without thinking about it. So how can we uh, uh, go to school daily? and transition into, into, uh, into the space where we need to be. Remembering our audience have become digital black belts. And I mean all of us have become digital black belts. So we more than ever need to make sure that every conversation, every communication that we have really does count. Whether that's your email list, whether it's your LinkedIn invite, your LinkedIn response, your LinkedIn comments, your tweet, uh, it doesn't matter. Every single point is an opportunity. Don't do it robotically. Don't be that store assistant who does the pre-programmed thing. Yes, I've just said uh, connect at LinkedIn. Send the message. Reach out to people. And like the community point above, look how you can help them. An example of this might be your email list. Let's start there. Just changing your sender's name can have a huge impact. Um, it can, you, you can use the same criteria that I used for the headline above to create um, a great subject line. You know, just think about it. If you worked for Apple, then I probably would put my email list from Apple because that will make everybody open up that email. And that's what you want. You want a response. You want people to connect to you. So how do you do that? You shake things up a little bit. Your subject lines can be tested and changed. Remember, subject lines are really, really super powerful. And they get LinkedIn responses open as well as emails open. And here's a couple of email hacks. What about putting emojis in your subject line? What about using informal, lowercase, casual subject lines? What about inserting someone's first name into that subject line and making it really personal? Yeah. Your challenge is to do something that stands out. And if you do that, you'll get good open rates. Good open rates, probably about 30 percent away you're at the top of the tree. 
And remember, if you are tracking guys, don't count multiple opens. If somebody opens it four or five times, that isn't five hits. You want uniques. And never let your open rate drop below 20%. Do some list surgery. Cut those people off that haven't opened your emails for several months. Don't waste your time and money on people that aren't interested. And importantly, if you aren't tracking, oh my God, you should be. Shame. If you haven't got an email list, shame. Email lists, where do they come from? They come from your followers on LinkedIn. They come from the regular com regular commentators on LinkedIn and your other social channels. But remember, permit they are all black belts in this digital age now. So you can use. These are just some of the few that I've used. There are many, many projects. And oh yeah, the psychology bit here is really super simple. It's about liking. Be the person in the room with something to say and you will find you get the audience because people gather around that person at the party with something to say. Next psychological point is around Faith Popcorn's work. And I read this book in 1991 when it first came out. Oh, my God, her outfit looks dated and so does her hair on this. Faith Popcorn describes something called cocooning, which has never been so true as now. And cocooning is the impulse to go inside when the going gets tough or scary outside. It's to pull a shell of safety around yourself when you're at the mercy of the mean, unpredictable outside world. Sound familiar to where we are today? I think it does. And so cocooning has led to a whole number of products which we might be able to learn from of marketeers in the event world. The armoured cocoon. The armoured cocoon has led to the grow in the paranoia industries. Everybody got a ring doorbell? Yeah, you get now where this is going. Home security systems, computerized watchdogs, tracking people who are working at home, emergency help, anti-snooping, and of course, warehousing of toilet rolls in your garage. This is all part of armored cocooning. But Faith Popcorn had another version of cocooning, socialized cocooning, characterized by surrounding yourself with the soothing, congenial friends in your cocoon. This is the lockdown version of the dinner party. And rather than entertaining at home as in the past, the social cocoon is characterized by invitations to a few close friends to a place where you love to be. The example of this as we started to move into lockdown are things like drive-in movies or hyper-local. How can you, as a national events organizer, become hyper-local? You've got to ask yourself those questions. Or how can you embrace this safety, this cocooning? Could you change the shape of your event? Could you make things less linear and more maze-like? How could you do it so people feel safe and secure? Back to some of the points from earlier. And then, and then finally, let's look to make things just that little bit more meaningful. Let's apply something called slow thinking. Now, slow thinking is when, um, as Frederick said, there are two types of cogn cognitive activity, system one and system two. And I'll make it really easy. This is a little psychology lesson. System one is executed when we have quick reflexes. What's three times three? I just activated your system one thinking. System two is much slower. It means more conscious thought. It means more effort, more energy burned. And so we, we shy away from it as humans. Um, what's 17 times 24? I've just activated your system two thinking. And I'll give you two questions just to demonstrate these two types of brain thinking. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer each, and then I'll give you the answers, of course. So let's start just with the, the lily pads question. There we go. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer that question. Just write or remember your answer. Da -da 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 Second question of two. Da -da 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 -da. There you go. And I obviously got a sound man here where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, and here are the answers. The intuitive answer to system one is typically 24 days, but the actual answer is 47 days. So don't worry, you're human if you got that wrong. If the lily pads double in size every day, the day before, 
it was half. So it's 47 of 48 days. The bat and ball question. I guess a lot of you said 10 pence. Most people I ask say 10 pence. That's the intuitive system one answer to that question. The answer is actually five pence for the ball and one pound and five for the bat, because one pound and five is a pound more than five, whereas 10 pence is 90 pence difference. You sort of get it, but you get that slow and fast thinking and slow and fast thinking is really, really important. Um, but you have to know when to apply it. Creativity more than anything benefits from slow thinking. That's where we get another psychological principle from authenticity. If you do things fast in your fast brain, you won't be authentic. You'll zigzag around. Whereas if we if we are creative and if we're slow, you'll get your authenticity. And the greatest marketing campaigns of all time were taken when care was care was given to the strategy and the messaging. And that gives you that that important, authentic message. Yes, today's world, the creative execution must be fast. It's got to be sped up. Social media demands everything to be fast. But if you get it wrong, your creative message that's right for Instagram isn't right for Facebook. It isn't right for Amazon or TikTok or or Triller, which I guess none of you have heard of unless you're about 11 years old. So what's needed to satisfy this authenticity is some detailed planning, a layered approach to your planning, time and care needs to be taken on the major messaging and the creative themes. That sets up the feeding of the beast, the social machine that needs fast, fresh content fed to you all the time. That's type one and type two thinking. That's fast and that's slow. So <clears throat> in conclusion, I've referenced a number of books, a number of academic articles, a number of web references. These are all staples. These are the things that I would urge you to read, but I'm not labeling any of you are lazy, but I know none of you will read these. And that's because knowledge on its own doesn't make a difference. Knowledge on its own doesn't make a difference. I know because we would all have great abs and a million dollars in the bank, wouldn't we? If it was just about knowledge. So you all need to create a compelling call to action for your audience. But it's still I don't think this would even work. So better, after my own research and what I know works, this might work better. It's a promise. It's strong. It's specific. It's like my headline. But to prove I'm not going to be contradictory to myself in any way, I don't know you as an audience. I haven't spoke to you. I haven't done any research. So I would still be hoping that this would work. Thank you. Any questions um, that you may have now? I would be glad to take those, Katie. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. I absolutely love your thank you. Stay six of your way. That's brilliant. And actually, that comes on to my question. Um, we haven't got much time, so I've just got one or two. Um, communicating safety safely is something I've been thinking about quite a lot. And I've been looking to retail, um, for examples. Um, do you think humour helps? Do you think, obviously, we've got to communicate in the way that our um, audience expect us to communicate. But is there a, can we break down that barrier and speak to people on a more human level? Do you think that that's OK. Psycholog um, psychologically I think wise. I think we um, we need to go through that process. So first of all, you, we, in that nanosecond, that type one thinking, people will react to whatever you do. And I've, I've had something on LinkedIn for a while where I first saw yellow and black hazard tape in retail to do cues. That sets alarm bells off. Wasps are yellow and black. So, mm. oh, my God, let's let's deal with that first reaction for somebody and control that. Once somebody feels in control, then you can take them whichever direction you want. But you have to get to that plateau first. Mm. If you don't arrive at the plateau, then you've jumped in too soon with your humor or you've jumped in too soon with whatever messaging you're trying to do. And they're still at the alarm stage. Yep. Yep. And the um, second question, just before we head off, um, are there any brands that you think that are inspiring you for their 2020 comms? Is there anyone, any brands, not necessarily events, but anything when you're looking to and thinking, wow, they've got that nailed? Yes. Um, so currently it's outside the events industry. I think Burger King are world class. Um, mm -hmm. People think well, Burger King are stunty. Um, I, I'm sure everyone saw the, the 30 day whopper that sort of slowly disintegrated and went mouldy, or they saw the drive into McDonald's. And if you were on McDonald's Wi-Fi, you could then order a Whopper for a penny. Um, people think they're stunty, but actually they're of an archetype of a brand type. They're the Joker. 
They're the guys who want to be the joker. McDonald's think you can have this family Sunday meal at McDonald's when all everyone's together and warm and cozy. Well, 40 years ago that worked, but it doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. So McDonald's want to be the caregiver as an archetype from what I referenced earlier in, um, in Carl Jung stuff, whereas um, BKs are the, are the jokers. I think they're doing things really, really well at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I absolutely and then, love and the then, Stevenage campaign oh, with Stevenage, oh, Stevenage Football Club. I don't know if anybody's oh, seen that. Uh, that was absolutely... I've watched that video about three times, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if you don't know, they got um, uh, BK's managed to get onto Xbox on Messi's shirt and everyone else by sponsoring Stevenage because they heard Stevenage were going to be on FIFA. Mm. That's and, FIFA and on was, Xbox, by the and way. And they saved a fortune in doing it by not sponsoring one of the other bigger football teams. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely genius. Yeah, good, it's absolutely good reference, genius. Katie, yeah. we'll, um, we'll send the link round as well to that video because I absolutely love it. Well, thank you so much, Tim. I really, really appreciate your um, contribution. Um, I've written down about a million notes, so I'm not going to go through my takeaways. But, um, yeah, we'd love, um, love to um, have a follow-up as well of all those links to the books as well. So, brilliant. Thank you so much, Tim. Super. I'll share those. Thank you, guys. Brilliant. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura, one of the founders at Tag Digital. Tag Digital is a PPC agency for event organisers. Our remit is to deliver visitor registrations, exhibitor leads, delegates, awards and new data for event organisers. We work in campaigns all over the world for organisers like Informa, Mesa Frankfurt, Dubai World Trade Centre, Essential, ITE and lots more.